I like where you're going with this. I would take it a step further. I, I, I have become um, a bit more, and it's not my nature to be cynical. It really isn't, despite some of the criticisms, you know, people will hear me say about things, you know, some of the goofy stuff in this community. But um, uh, I'm presently in, in the last few years have been of the opinion that um, I would say rather than a contract, rather than even, well, it might have been a form of a treaty. I think what happened was, and this is speculation, but I think what happened was the, um, the, the, the realization, the revelation that um, what we had done, what had happened through Operation Paperclip was that we had compromised ourselves. And this, this post-war German group made it clear that we had compromised ourselves through Operation Paperclip because our, our military industrial complex as such as we know it um, really, uh, really stood up and began to exist after World War II. And look how many of these Operation Paperclip associated Germans were involved in these companies, involved in the, the standing up of these programs. Um, all of them, NASA, CIA, all uh, levels uh, of them. Well, even some of the aerospace companies and yeah. such. Um, y- yeah, you know, all of it. And I think the, I, I think it was a horrific realization, um, which, uh, you know, you talk, people talk about the Eisenhower meeting with the aliens. And I, I like what you said, because, you know, you have to consider what if it wasn't some, fantastical meeting with aliens what if it was the meeting with the post-war nazi international representatives and basically because think about what what eisenhower said in that speech of warning us about the military industrial complex think about that that to me suggests that the meeting the 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 famous meeting in the lore might have been with um with this not you know the nazi international as joseph farrell puts it and the culmination of that horrific realization okay, was very possibly the JFK assassination, okay? Um, And there are historical reasons to suspect the German hand in that, which is a whole other discussion, but also think of the fact that um, in San Carlos de Bariloche, famously, you know, connected with Nazi post-war presence down in South America, how it, I think it's every U.S. president, is it since Kennedy, has gone down there at some point. You know, now it's a resort town, but there's a lot of resort towns all around the world and throughout South America. Isn't it interesting that all our presidents at some point um, visit San Carlos de Bariloche? Are they going there to meet with, you know, the big representative you know, the big head of, you know, whatever this Nazi international is. Um, I, I don't know, but um, yeah, there, there's, there's reasons to suspect that what's going on here um, in, in being uh, allowed to be covered up and spun with the whole UFO ET thing, what actually might be going on here is something um, sadly and more darkly, very human, but, but very sinister. Um, yeah, and they couldn't just come out and be like they had to make the spin the you know aliens and and you know extraterrestrials because if they were to uh, how could they explain that you yeah. know that this group that was supposedly defeated during World War II and and that we won the war and they lost is back and yet yeah. and yet here they were instrumental in building our military industrial complex and increasingly it's become finally obvious to the public over the more recent years is our entanglement not just our entanglement in wars but how these wars are conducted and this first i i think maybe we had hints with some of the weird decisions that harry truman made during korea you know in not that that, that there's the instance of not crossing the yalu river and all that and then vietnam that there was you know the people you know fighting vietnam they were like wait a minute we're over here for this goal this this objective that we're told and that the people are told but 
there's people, the, the way we're fighting this, it seems like two steps forward, one step back kind of thing. And yet, um, the people that continued to get rich off of it were the people building the war machine. And now we're at a point where people are openly wondering, you know, let's see, 9-11, so we go to Iraq? What? And, you know, 9-11, uh, you know, uh, uh, bin Laden, Afghanistan, and yet we go into Iraq and we're there for 20 years? <laughs> Ultimately, what is that serving? It's serving the military industrial complex. It's serving the people building, the, you know, making money off of the machinery and, and all the. Yeah, uh, war, war equals money, unfortunately. And uh, you brought up uh, JFK there. And, and, and through my research, uh, you know, JFK and his uh, you know, assassination, because JFK had connections in his early 20s with the secretary of the navy after world war ii james forrestal yeah and uh he kind of took jfk under his wing and uh you know looked at jfk as like a protege and they uh apparently there's a suspicion that him and uh james forrestal traveled to germany after the war uh, after the war uh to see the the famous uh you know the glocka ufo bell craft that you know, as we've been talking about the, the German aerospace techs we're working on. And after they came back, uh, John F. Kennedy ran for Senate and Forrestal became the very first secretary of defense. And out of that, it's, you know, uh, speculated that MJ-12 was born. And James yeah. Forrestal being the one of the first members of uh MJ-12 or Majestic 12, as it's known, you know, the group of men overseeing the UFO and saucer technology here in the U.S., you know, developing their American uh, secret space program. So, and in my research, JFK definitely knew something about what we were developing and, and sure. what we had. And he was trying to maybe, uh, Jay Widener talks about this, he was trying to maybe force the hand of the cabal into revealing their advanced technology and their craft by saying that, you know, we're going to go to the moon by the, the late seventies, knowing mm. uh, dang well that we couldn't get there in standard rocket rocketry, you know, Werner uh, yeah. von Braun, you know, uh, it's always cited and it's always stated that, you know, he was just before JFK announced that we were trying to, we were going to get to the moon by the late sixties uh, in uh -huh. Congress. Uh, Werner von Braun, like a couple of months before that, was saying that, you know, it would take a, uh, a rocket the size of the Empire State Building to get to the moon. So it's kind of speculated that maybe uh, JFK was trying to do something. He knew that the technology that uh, the, the Germans had during World War II and that we were mm -hmm. trying to bring that technology over into America and develop it here uh, with some of the uh, Project Paperclip uh, people. And then that, that was the way that we were actually getting to the moon. And, and Sure. Maybe. Yeah, I, I do think that there was there's, um, you know, a classified aspect to the technology that to this day still hasn't been revealed because uh it would have been applied to other technologies and continue to be military technologies and continue to be developed so of course it's going to remain uh classified um well and then trump not uh you know releasing the full the full um right. jfk file too he only released a a portion of the file as well so that makes you think that there there's something well really remember important. Remember what I think it's uh, Joseph Napolitano, the judge, uh, tr uh, uh, he says that Trump said to him when he asked him about this, he says, hey, you're going to release all this. And, uh, and according to Napolitano, if I'm getting the name right, um, he said that Trump said, if you were to see what's in the file, he goes, you wouldn't have released it either. Uh, apparently, there's something that's so, you know. WTF in there <laughs> that even Trump said, I, there, I, I can't release it. And so, you know, you think about that. Think about that context. What if go back to the hypothetical idea? What if, it, it's my opinion that we were very light. Here comes the cynical part that we were very likely um, essentially invaded through Operation Paperclip. And I say that because 
the origins of the Germany we know today, okay, the origins of what led to the Prussian states being brought together, the whole unification thing, just the, which then led, of course, to Nazi Germany. The origins of all that go back in German history to the medieval era with the Junkers, okay? And here's what they would do. They would choose a target that they wanted to essentially take over their thing, their region, their in whatever, their power, and um, they would befriend that target. And, you know, the number of years they would provide them with their expertise, their know-how, all the benefits of, you know, their agricultural technology and know-how stuff, and they would build them up. Okay, while they were doing that, once they got them built up and they would ingratiate themselves with them, they would, you know, intermarry with the families and such. And while they were doing that, they would be quietly making overtures to that group's enemy or adversary. Okay. And then once they built up that one group and had their claws into them in all levels of their society and industry, then they would instigate a conflict with their adversary and they would back the adversary. And then the adversary would come in and, you know, conquer the people who was the, were the original target of the Yunkers. And, um, then the Yunkers would shift their alliance openly to the invaders, and then they would do that again to them. Now, um, then they started uh, uh, using they started using industry more. So we get to the 20th century, and Halmer shocked, and we have what Germany did throughout the 19th century, which really through most of that century, remember it would have been the Prussians who are the descendants of this Junkers, this duplicitous Junkers uh, society or, or uh, class, um, they would bring German industry to foreign countries, right? And say, hey, let us bring this industry, this industrial base to you or whatever. And they would ingratiate themselves with that nation where they would bring their technology and then from within, through banking, through industry, through political influence, they would pretty much take over that country. And they would do it. It was kind of like a quiet invasion. Now, if anybody, this dates back to the medieval time, they were doing this for centuries using this model. If anybody went out of line or attempted to expose or resist this, there was this particular group that emerged that would do, get this, this dates back to medieval times. They would do very public and violent executions and assassinations to get send the message. You will not resist. OK, so now put this in the 20th century context. OK, gee, um, you know, Colonel Harry Armstrong comes up with the idea of bringing German scientists to the States. And uh, he greatly got that idea through the German scientists he had known for 20 years. OK, German aerospace medicine experts. And it was like, yeah, yeah, you know, you, you could do this program, this plan where you bring us in. And Armstrong was like, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. So apply that old medieval Junkers model to United States in uh, World War II, post-World War II. And it's like, okay, they get their guys in. And where did they get their guys into? The heart of our defense structure. And what did they do? They bring German industrial expertise and say, yeah, United States, you need to have what we call this military industrial complex to really build up and on and so forth. And you see where, oh my God, they use their old medieval tricks to essentially invade. And then in the intervening years between World War II and say the JFK assassination, they had what? Nearly 20 years to, uh, to fully have their hooks into our military industrial complex, uh, but also to, to, you know, banking influence and social influence so that by the time Eisenhower, it's made clear to him, basically we own you. And he tries to warn us. Okay. It's too late. And so that by the time JFK realizes what's going on, he is going to resist them. Like, you know, we know, and so what happens? Remember that medieval group that would do very public and violent assassinations? It, what I'm saying is the history of the United States since World War II, when you're looking at the context of Operation Paperclip, 
it fits exactly the the model that these nefarious Prussian Junkers Germans have been doing since medieval times when they want to take over a country. And I, I think that's what they did to us. I, I think that's why the, the worst things in our political history have happened since World War II, right? Our, our politicians are the most corrupt that they ever have been in our history since World War II and, and on and on and so forth. And when you look at this model that I'm talking about, it explains it better than any other possibility. And um, it, it's kind of scary. It is really scary. And the, the question I have, though, is was the Operation Paperclip something that we did of our own volition? Did we decide to do that? Or was Operation Paperclip done more from a if we did indeed sign some kind of contract or some kind of treaty with Germany? Was that part of, uh, I mean, not Germany, but the breakaway civilization after World War II? Was that part of, maybe part of the deal of the contract or the treaty that we signed that they had to, that we had to bring a certain number of their people into our country? Uh, I don't think it was that open. I think it was a much more um, uh, insidious kind of underhanded thing. Um, you know, Colonel Herring, a, a lot of people think Operation Paperclip was all about the bomb and the rockets. Actually, what get this, what where Operation Paperclip started and emerged from was I mentioned those aerospace medicine specialists. OK, aerospace medicine, um, what they're all about is keeping human beings alive at high altitude and in space. These guys have been working on this since the 1920s, starting with, the, but with high altitude and stuff. And their original goal always was to put man in space, dating back to the 1920s. Okay, so that was the origin of Operation Paperclip, were, and specifically a guy named Colonel Harry Armstrong. Now, here's the thing. There's very strong evidence to suggest that Perhaps he came up with this idea, as I said a moment ago, through um, a suggestion from those German scientists that he had been friends with since before the war that were now part of the Nazi war machine. So it, it's very, very possible that the idea of paperclip might have been suggested initially by one of these very German scientists who benefited OK. And while that very much could have been the plan, it's like, OK, the, the German nation is we're about ready to lose this war. It's time to make our move. Um, How do we infiltrate? How do we get over there? How do we let's infiltrate over? the United States, the guys that are kicking our asses, you know, and and it's like come up with something. OK, how do we how do we use our model? OK, well, we can suggest this idea of, oh, bring in German scientists to help the Allied war effort. And that's how we get in. And what's a better way to invade a nation um, than than being part of their military industrial complex? And then, you know, you can get in and do the other things, the political corruption, the, this, that and the other. But I do think that we were. Uh, essentially the invasion came through initially operation paperclip and and that our military industrial complex and i am a military officer and you know and have been in the national you got you know my background and when i think about you know oh my gosh wow you know much of our you know our war our big post world war ii massive war machine to think that really um, it was the product of this um, uh, soft invasion, so to speak. It, it's disturbing. You know, it, it, it really, uh, it, you know, look at, um, you, you just, to me, you look at the post-World War II history of the United States, and, it's, and when you learn this about the German history and this specific group doing this since medieval time, the medieval era, um, it, it just, it's disturbingly uh, resonant. And, and yeah, it's like they just picked up all the things that they were doing in Germany and just transplanted them. Oh, yeah. Just the United States. Oh, <laughs> what, what did I tell you? Those, those Junkers, this is what they did. Oh, let us share our technology with you. And we'll, yeah. they did this to the Teutonic Knights. OK, they destroyed 
the, the Teutonic Knights this way because they ingratiated themselves. Oh yes, we'll be your friends. We'll help you build up your, you know, your castles and your technology. Well, oh yeah, we're your friend. We're your friend. And at the same time, they were working on the class that finally overcame the control of the military class. And, and they did this in a very duplicitous, nefarious, corrupt way. Um, uh, there's a book titled The Thousand Year Conspiracy by a guy named Paul Winkler. And it was written in 1937. It was published during the war, but it was written before World War II started. And it's just, it's, it's, I think it'll give you, it'll, it'll definitely give you a, a particular perspective on the post-World War II history, particularly what we're talking about here. It's, it's a disturbing book, um, but there it is. And it has, you know, existed since 19. 19- 37 and there he's describing the german history in a book that just a few years later this very thing he's describing appears to be exactly what happens in the united states yeah it's it's very you know and i know a lot of people don't want to hear oh it's like joseph farrell everything's nazis well i hate to tell you but (laughs) uh, you know when you look when you give an honest look the not the, you know the the post World War II guys Nazi international whatever you want to call them they're in there they're in the mix it cannot be denied and it 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 just fits too well with um, models they used in the past so it, it's not as fun as aliens but and I think that this is a big reason why they've pushed uh, a lot of the researchers out of this community because it was like I, I was talking about in the beginning whenever we started it seems like they, they've really pushed the the hardcore researchers such as yourself and a few others out of the conference circuit they're they're pushing them out of you know uh being you know out there in the spotlight like these contactees and like these uh you know people that are talking about abductions and all that stuff and i think that the reason that they're doing that is because the the hardcore researchers actually you know know the truth right that well, that we've had this technology since the mid 1800s or even before yeah. that and they don't want the information getting out because it blows their whole plan you know wide open you know blows it out of the water that you know that this technology is of alien or- origins and the ufo's in the sky are extraterrestrials and i know, was very I was very suspicious back in 2015. Um, if you recall, the 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 so-called SSP or secret space program research topic, the field, the little sub field in the field, of this stuff. Um, <coughs> the leg- what I say legitimate, the serious, more scholarly research and investigation into this idea that there was a classified space program was making great headway. In fact, the gentleman from the Netherlands who were putting together these fantastic SSP conferences. I think the first one was in Amsterdam in 2011 or 12, but um, in, in they culminated in the San Mateo conference in um, 2014 and the one in Texas in 2015. The uh, attendance was getting larger with each conference. You had Joseph Farrell. I spoke at the 2015 one. I was at the 2014 one. I didn't speak at that one, but you had Joseph Farrell, John Brandenburg, um, Paul LaViolette, Michael Schratt, um, uh, 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 oh my gosh, uh, Mark McCandlish. You had people that were looking at, you know, the UFO thing, the SSP thing from, I'm sorry, the SSP issue from a, a more grounded, uh, what's the technology being developed um, perspective. And they were making great headway because you know, it turns out there's a lot more evidence for that than there was, you know, some of these other explanations. And in 2015, um, you saw the emergence, I call it the imposition of, you know, people like Corey Good and all, all them who were making these wild claims about being uh, time jumping space commandos and being ambassadors to the the blue this that and the other and and mm-hmm. and the secrets and they were using secret space program the term and what happened was you had the UFO media just fawning over this ridiculous stuff 
And they started pushing these guys, you know, you, you, for every time you might hear Joseph Farrell, for example, or John Brandenburg being interviewed about their secret space program ideas and research, these wild storytellers with this ridiculous fairy tale stuff would be on five or 10 times. And what happened was um, the idea of an SSP, the conversation turned to this wacky stuff and it got the, the attention away from the more serious stuff. And I don't think that's an accident. I, I think somebody sounds said, like a co-op uh, kind of thing. Yeah, somebody. And, and you could say, well, where would that come from? The, the, the wackadoodle people, I think, were unwitting. They just got the benefit of getting you know, a, a lot of attention. I think what it is, if you want to find the culprits uh, who were involved directly, in uh, uh, messing with the narrative and, and causing the real research to be suppressed, you got to look at UFO media. You got to look at the radio hosts and the shows. Everybody knows who they are, um, who were pushing the ridiculous stuff because because the producers are the ones who decide who's going to be on, not so much the hosts. And it would be very easy for any one of those producers to be influenced by you know some outside context saying, hey, push this guy, don't, you know, push those guys. It would be very easy. Um, well, I'm the, I'm the producer and the host of this show, so I can, you know, that's the way to do it. See, I'm so, there, I can yeah, bring yeah. on whoever I want to bring on. And I, hey, have there had, you go. I have had some of these, uh, you know, people on my show about the, you know, the secret space program experiencers and, uh, you know, something never really, uh, there, there's a few of them. I'll give them that. There's a few of them that are, that I think that are, you know, kind of legit and, and they do have some real 3D uh, experiences that, that, but, that but I believe what has happened here. But the, the a majority of them, a lot of them, I think it's exactly yeah. like what we were talking about earlier, that the 90-10, right? There's 90% yeah. of us, uh, the, the UFOs is all us in our military and 10% is, uh, you know, actual ETs. I think that that's the way yeah. that it is with the SSP community experiencers and contactees. But, but, There's 10% of them that sure. might be legit. And then the other 90% of them are yeah. just wackadoo uh, uh, you know, well, but what else you do is uh, that the other outlets, venues don't do, you know, I, I would say you have much more, um, uh, you, you you'll talk to Joseph Farrell, you'll talk to someone like me and, and others um, as much as you would talk to, you know, experiencers. You won't just shun and shut out the more technologically grounded um, or, or the more research-based um, authors like uh, that's what some of the venues did they just got to where they wouldn't have the 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 research based ssp you know folks they would just have the wacky crazy stuff and and that's all people paying attention to those venues would see someone like yourself shows like yours um offer yeah you'll talk to those people but you'll also talk to the you know the other side of it and so your listeners get the opportunity really to decide for themselves because they're hearing all the different angles, you know, you'll, you'll, you, you know, you're talking to me today, you'll, you'll, you know, run this show. And then maybe the next day you'll have somebody who totally disagrees with me, but that's, that's balance and that's good, you know, cause that, mm -hmm. that's the way it should be. Um, but uh, when, if people really want to, um, uh, influence and really control a narrative, what the easy way to do it is just like you said, shut out certain voices and play up other voices that will serve the narrative that you prefer. And I think that's what went on with SSP. The subject of SSP is that um, people were only hearing um, uh, a, a limited, they were, they were getting a, a limited exposure to the subject as a whole. They weren't hearing um, the other possibilities. So in their minds, they were equating SSP stuff with, with, you know, just the, the more fantastical versions of the narrative. Yeah, the fairy tale rainbow land unicorn uh, part of it. Yeah. You know? But there's another sure. problem that I've, you know, found in, in this community too, uh, Walter, is 
not only the the crazy wackadoo uh, alien stories that, that people are you know talking about, but also the infiltration of counterintelligence people, right? Yeah. You know, to, to you know, kind of keep everybody because that's another way to do it and control the narrative yeah. is you put counterintelligence people in there mixed in with all these crazy True. fairy tale uh, abduction stories, you know, and, and all these uh, space battles and time travel and like all, all yeah. this stuff, you know, True. and and they don't want people actually doing real, you know, right. research like what you've done, you know, because if people start looking into this stuff, they, they find the uh, Bell technology, which leads to uh, SAC and the Prussians, which leads to NIMSA and then our government and our military and these breakaway civilizations to this very day, you know? And yeah, that's yeah the, the people will find the nugget of truth that will lead too closely to what's really going on that they don't want us to know. Yep. You're right. You know, that's, and that's what I think that the, the CIA counterintelligence people in this community uh, are there to do, you know, like, uh, uh, Lou Elizondo, uh, Richard Doty. The, the first thing, I don't know how you feel on those people, and we don't really have to get into it here because that's not really what my show is about. But, you know, the, the first thing that they say on, you know, TV or the Internet, you know, watching any UFO uh, footage like the Tic Tac or, you know, the Nimitz footage. Oh, oh we don't have any craft like that you know right the government or military definitely probably maybe doesn't have anything like that you right. know and that default uh, defies the laws of gravity you know and well they might but due to national security reasons yeah. <laughs> you know we can't say and i just yeah. laugh every time that i hear that because we know that they're lying you know the the like we've talked about for the you know past hour and a half here you know that they've been developing these technologies since the mid 1800s and even the the mm -hmm. b2 uh, stealth bomber used right. anti -grav gravitics in it and you know there's a patent out for the the tr3b like mm -hmm. give me a break like i don't understand who who would these people think that they're they're fooling there know? are patents out there that would explain the tic tac and the object that was seen by the uh the uh the, the navy off the east coast the sphere in the square thing and yet people who want to believe the et narrative conveniently will just ignore that or they'll come up with some you know ridiculous uh, you know reason why they 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 won't buy that and and as i said meanwhile meanwhile the real ETs, you know, they're like flying around, not getting noticed, probably, <laughs> you know, because everybody's looking at the bamboozle tech, you know, that they're saying, oh, no, that's not ours. We couldn't possibly have that. You know, um, uh, 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 you are probably familiar with Greg Bishop. I've known him for years. And one thing he says that I've always liked is that, you know, if if there's something weird in the sky going on, getting your attention or everybody's attention. He, he suggests turn around and look behind you to see what it is that that thing might be a distraction for. Mm. Right. So I, I find that intriguing. It's like, Oh, and, and I'm not just saying that, you know, the, the thing in the sky is a fake and it's a, it could be the ETs use that. Maybe ETs use the, the big show in the sky of the ooh, ah, flying saucer thing, because what they're actually doing is behind you and they don't want you to see that. They want you to be looking at the thing in the sky, um, you know, uh, but I, I find that to be an interesting suggestion. And it's a good thing to keep in mind that could um, explain part of the mystery of the whole UFO mystery you know, to be redundant, is that th th there's some form of sleight of hand going on here with this uh, on various levels. Um, and I find that it, it can be frustrating, but it's very intriguing, you know, when sleight of hand is being employed. And it could be employed by military industrial types that are wanting us to believe their secret technology is, is not ours. But it could also easily be employed by actual people from other worlds coming here. That's very intriguing to me. Well, here's the thing, too, uh, Walter. You know, when you're looking back through history, it seems that they never reveal or hint at any technology, any new technology, that is, until they're getting ready to use it. 
right? Yeah. The the B2 uh, B2 stealth bomber was hidden for a really long time, right? Mm-hmm. That was very regarded under high amounts of secrecy, right? Until they needed to use it in a war. So if you take that logic and you apply it to the UFOs, mm-hmm. and you know we've just been discussing this, uh, you know here tonight that that this technology is, you know, man-made and we've had it for a long time and it's not right. aliens, it's not ETs, it's us, right. it's humans. So them revealing it uh, and, and finally saying in uh, 2020 that the UFOs are, are real or that they're really unidentified or whatever, the UIPs, whatever they've rebranded them as, mm. uh, based off of history, when you look at that, is them letting us know that we have this technology yeah. And we plan to use it soon. Yeah. Yeah. I, th- this is the thing we should be concerned about with specifically the Tic Tac issue. I'm in the camp that from day one was convinced that this is this was something that our military industrial folks, our aerospace industry is developing for military use. Remember, the incident happened in 2004, we are told, right? But it's not until, what, 2017 or so that that it's revealed publicly. And what's interesting is we have big, much more saber rattling between us and China at the time that this Tic Tac incident is revealed than we did in 2004. So it's almost just it could suggest exactly what you're saying. They're concerned that the time is at hand that we might have to start using this stuff. So now it's time to play these hinting games. And, and the hinting isn't just aimed at us, the public, the hinting is aimed at the potential adversary. It's it's believe me the the Chinese military technical experts are looking at that Tic Tac story and going, the idea is what we're saying is look at this and look how far we had taken it in 2004. And it's almost 20 years later, guys, imagine what we might have in our arsenal, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And the Chinese military guys, for example, they get it, you know, and and they're reading it that way. They're looking at it as, okay, wow, what does the U.S. have? And it's this game of subterfuge and all this, it's this dance of, and the hope people say, well, what would that serve? Why not just keep a secret weapon completely secret? The hope is to avoid conventional war, open warfare. So what you kind of hope is maybe to delay what you might think is the inevitable through um, uh, this hint of technology so that the potential adversary maybe backs off any uh, uh, war plans or, or plans to light it up because they're not quite sure the level of our military technology you know it, it's maybe an attempt to discourage it and that's just one of many possibilities we unfortunately you know i've been out of the military for you know over 20 years now you know i'm a civilian with the rest of you and we unfortunately are the last who are going to understand what's really going on with this for better or worse there are good reasons why we don't know this but unfortunately there are also nefarious reasons why it's kept from us and and we unfortunately um we're we're the low man on the totem pole as it were as far as knowing what all this means and what all this is and um you know it puts us in a you know an anxious position i think because of that i agree and uh for the last thing that i wanted to discuss with you here today walter is uh because I, I've been trying to let my audience know for a while now that, you know, that there isn't any crazy outside force that's really out there, uh, you know, manipulating us on a huge level. It's not, you know, archons, it's not reptilians, it's not these imaginary, uh, you know, things that we've made up to mystify our controllers and that, that these controllers are very human, right? Yeah. And the, the human, uh, humans always leave a paper trail, right? You can always track where they've been by, you know, what they fund and what they do. So uh, from my understanding, you have 
uh, researched a, the, the money funders behind uh, the Prussians. Uh, and you've also, you've tracked this and you've not only tracked the, uh, the Prussians, but you've, uh, you, Prussians nin, Ninza, but you know, the people that were funding the Sonara Aero Club uh, as well. And I just wanted to uh, quickly get your, well, not quickly, we can go as how, however long uh, you need to go to fully get your explanation of who was, uh, you know, funding these groups, because I believe that this is a very important aspect to, you know, figure out who was supplying uh, and funding uh, the, the Prussians and, uh, and then right, the-, the bankers. And yeah, and it, yeah it's interesting when you look at the history of the banks that existed and how far they go back and their connections to the modern, you know, uh, German banks. So I, when I say modern, I mean, going into the 20th century in the World War II era. And then since then, leading right up to Deutsche Bank, um, there are... Um, <clears throat> These are the candidates for who would have been financing a group like NIMSA. And this helps you uh, pinpoint individuals, right? Because you can look at, okay, who, who were the bankers themselves? Uh, and you can do the same thing with the uh, then Prussian, ultimately German um, industrial base, right? I do a similar thing with those guys dating back to um, the very last few years of the 18th century and going, you know, through the 19th century, um, the, the guys who were the leaders in the technology of the day, you know, the industrialists, and then you see how many of them um, were at the same time fascinated with um, exotic technology or, or um, the occult, right? And, and when I say the occult, I mean, what would lead them to um, uh, learning what the secret societies, what the lost technology would have been. <clears throat> and this was the kind of thing these guys were interested in so that when you're looking at what Delshaw reported was being done in the mid 19th century, when you look at in the 20th century, <clears throat> Nazi Germany and we know that a lot of those guys were also fascinated with the occult. What were they learning in these ancient texts? You know, what, what were they learning that they were developing in a practical way? And I, I think that through looking at these people, the, the potential financiers, the uh, industrialists that would had to have been the ones involved in this, um, you can better pinpoint the, the answers to those questions as to what were they learning? What, what were they looking for? Because you can see it in where the money went and you can see it in what was being developed. You know, something like the bell has the fingerprints of, you know, an ancient lost technology all over its concept. And even when you look at something like the Racine turban, well, you know, um, uh, up until the mid 19th century, you still had philosopher scientists. Okay. These were technicians and, and scientific experts who were also fascinated with these esoteric concepts. Okay. And so, uh, you know, Racine himself could very well have been influenced by some of these exotic um, suspected ancient lost technologies in the development of his turban. Okay, uh, very much so. He could have been influenced by that. So, and this is the milieu of what was going on in the 19th century. And um, uh, when you look at what was the direction Germany went with their exotic technology and their advanced technology in the 20th century, and you look at what Delshaw was reporting and, and all this stuff that, you know, with the airship mysteries and, and the Sonora Aero Club, and then you look at these industrialists who were very tight with the bankers because these were the guys where they would get their money to do this stuff, and you look at their interests, um, it, uh, it really enlightens you to what they might have actually been up to, what they were about, and it makes sense of um, the rise of Nazi Germany, the rise of their technological base and, and the direction. It, it's my opinion that NIMSA, whatever NIMSA was, was absorbed into the whole Nazi machine. 
that it, I'm, I'm convinced of that. And um, I, I, I think that that led ultimately to the Deutsche Bank of that, you know, that's been around since World War II and still exists today. You've got the roots of this in there. Um, so yeah, it, I find it interesting that Deutsche Bank was the first bank that was listed on the stock exchange after uh, 9-11 too. Um, right. You mentioned the occult uh, in there, the occult aspect uh, of this. And it did, is that where the, uh, is there an OTO connection that, that fits into all this, Walter? You know, Alistair Crowley, Carl uh, hey. Kindler and uh, Theodore uh, Rusis, I think is his last name. Royce, yeah, Rice, Rice, something Rice. like that. You, you, you had some of the guys I talk about in my origin book um, the, you know, that are part of this thread that I lay out for the, you know, connecting the whole concept of the NIMS and the Sonora Era Club and all that to, you know, the 20th century and Nazi Germany. So, yes, yeah, some of these guys were definitely, a couple of them were in the OTO, but here's how I view it because based on what I've found and what, you know, others I think have found also. You had, you had your occult groups that, you know, part of it was dedicated to all the more wild contacting entities and the high magic and and so forth which lends to the more theatrical side of it okay it's natural theatrics but within that you had these guys that approach this stuff from a more grounded perspective and applied what they learned in what the, in a more practical fashion so in other words when you had if you were to have uh, uh crowley and some of the others doing high magic rituals to create a moon child and do all this you know ethereal stuff you would have had these germans th that i'm talking about in this saying okay how do we apply these the these esoteric principles that we're learning through this magic how do we apply it in a practical material technology. So they would have been more focused on what, what are the, the, the possibly the ancient technological secrets embedded in what these occult groups have in their archives and such. So I, 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 I see it as two paths, um, you know, that could be followed in, these groups these occult groups and when we're talking about these particular germans involved in all this stuff this esoteric technology stuff i think their focus would have been on okay what was it that you know the ancient uh, you know is in the ancient tibetan archives about uh, you know the vimanas what have you or whatever i it, that's how i see it so the point is where you where you can point to some of these germans being in these occult groups, I think their focus was less on uh, the the theatrical high magic, you know, stuff, and it was more on a, a practical application of these magical principles, much like a true alchemist and what the philosopher scientists really, um, you know, what a lot of them would do. So that's the tradition that I place them in. To try and weaponize what they'd uh, kind of, yeah, to, out to apply it in any kind of practical technology, uh, you know, weaponry would be, you know, an ultimate one of the products of that. Sure, absolutely, obviously, we know that. Mm -hmm. But uh, but who knows what else? Remember, let's not forget that, like I said, and everybody knows this, uh, the, the German rocket scientists that we got and the Russians got when these were very young men first going into this their serious goal it wasn't just a flight of fancy their serious goal for getting into and developing the rocket technology and stuff was they were serious about wanting to put people in space dating back to the 1920s okay and um uh, you know so it's not just an application for applying it to war in a way was a way to get the funding right so yeah, okay, we'll make your war machines while at the same time in developing that, we're gaining the knowledge that we need to get to space, for example. So that returns us to the discussion of classified space programs, be they of a nation, of a military, or of a private group, 
right? Like a breakaway group. So, uh, you know, we get to the 20th century and that becomes a very real possibility of, you know, a, a, a private group. And now we're in the era of, you know, uh, Elon Musk, Richard Branson, and um, Dr. Evil, Jeff Bezos, you know, all building their own rockets because they have Dr. the money Evil. to do and, and getting us into space. And, and they're, they're just openly, think about it. Those three guys, what they've been doing is really just openly what perhaps rich guys were maybe attempting to do secretly a hundred years ago. I, I agree. And I think a lot of them are really working together and they're only giving the illusion that they're separated because, you know, from my understanding, the, uh, the U S and Prussia, which we've discussed that Prussia became the ruler of Germany and the Russian empire under the czars were mm -hmm. all, they were all allies during the civil war, right? But Prussia and the Russian czars were supporting the North and all of their uh, spy agencies were working together. And was, oh yeah. And, and you, you hear it said that, um, you know, Abraham Lincoln greatly relied on Russia um, during the civil war. They loaned the, the, the United States a lot of money <laughs> to help um, fund that, uh, fund that effort. Yeah. And I think that, you know, they're all secretly, you know, working together in Prussia, Russia, and uh, the U U.S. I think that this, you know, just my opinion, that this was a source of, you know, the, the OSS group, you know, the Office of Strate Strategic Services. Well, yeah. you know, we're working with these people. So you have three uh, very powerful countries being Prussia, which is, Prussia was, the, you know, the ruler, became the ruler of Germany, you have the Russian czars and the U.S., possibly all, you know, working on this uh, advanced technology yeah. together, you know, and sure. uh, who knows how many uh, of these groups or whatever were successful, you know, and, and how long, when that technology, if that technology got carried over. Yeah. I mean, obviously it did get carried over, but it, it, it's interesting how they, they'll be working behind the scenes uh all together, but out in the public, you know, they're, they're enemies and they're, you know, at, at sure, each other's yeah. necks all the time, you know? Yeah. The, the, the narratives that have to be, you know, pushed and promoted and, um, uh, it, it, it's, yeah, there, there's the aspect that it's a show for us, you know, the masses so that, um, you know, certain things can be done and accomplished, um, according to what their actual plans are. Right. But, uh, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Walter, for coming on my show. I really sure. appreciate you a lot. We've been uh, going for almost uh, two hours here and, um, you know, I would love to bring you back on uh, sometime to explore, you know, any sure. other topics because, you know, we can go into so many different uh, directions here, but uh, let people know where uh, they can find you online and where they can, uh, get your books. Okay. Well, I have the Walter Bosley channel at YouTube and, um, uh, that's, I do a live stream every Sunday afternoon. Um, but I also do, you know, pre-recorded, um, little reports and, and readings and things like that. Uh, my books are print on demand only and available only at lulu.com. Um, I've had a publishing company for 20 years now this year and uh, um, uh, Lulu, I use Lulu as a printer distributor and they make a great product, but Lulu.com, my stuff's not on Amazon. Amazon's not good for small press publishers. So um, Lulu's great, uh, really great service. They, you know, they do a great quality uh, printing and um, yeah, that's it. Ma'am, Walter Bosley channel and uh, lulu.com for the books. Awesome. Thank you so much. The links to uh, Walter's stuff will be in the description of this video. I highly recommend you check out his books. Uh, Origin of the 19th Century Emergence of the 20th Century Breakaway Civilizations, uh, uh, Shimmering Light, uh, Lost in MK Ultra, House of Anu, and of course his, um, uh, his most popular books, uh, Empire of the Will series. Uh, you know, the these are the researchers and these are the people that we really need to be, uh, you know, listening to and supporting when it comes to disclosure. So uh, click the link in the description to go over there and, uh, and, and purchase his books. 
Uh, for everyone else, uh, thanks for watching and listening. Much love to everyone in the chat. Please be sure to hit that thumbs up button to help support the channel and the YouTube algorithm. Share, subscribe, hit the bell icon as well for notifications. The link to my channel on Rockfin is in the description. Sign up over there, hit the follow button. And you can catch this episode and any of my other episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, and download them individually on your device for free on Spreaker. Dot com. Again, thank you so much uh, for coming on, Walter. Sure, uh, thanks for love having to me. have you uh, back on in the future. And uh, remember, we're not only in a spiritual war, but a war on humanity. Stay aware, stay alert, keep loving your heart for everyone. Stay f- safe out there. And if you can see through the illusion, you are the solution. See you guys next time.